It's being recorded, uh, so we want you to stay on mute. And if you keep your videos off uh, throughout the session, it tends to uh, let everything move more smoothly over the internet. So please put your questions and comments in the chat box and we will catch up with them with the panel and afterwards. Um, so what will happen is I will introduce our uh, esteemed guest speaker uh, and then there will be a reactive panel um, with our great friends from the National Education Association, AFT, uh, American Federation of Teachers, the Association of School Business Officials International, and the Massachusetts School Facility uh, Construction Association. Um, and uh, as soon as we get into this, I think it will move very, very quickly. Towards the end of the session, around uh, two o'clock, uh, we will have an open Q&A and they will be, we will be taking some of those chat box questions at that time. So thanks again so much. And uh, now let me um, introduce our esteemed speaker, uh, Dr. Paula Olsuski. Uh, she is a contributing scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and a pioneering leader in policy and scientific research programs in microbiology and the chemistry of indoor environments. I'm sure some of you on the call understand that indoor and outdoor environments share some things in common, uh, but they part company in a hurry because indoor environments have so much uh, more complexity to them. During her, during her 20 uh, years at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, she led innovative and multidisciplinary programs that inspired, accelerated, and produced lasting impact. She was particularly interested in research capacity through the creation of diverse stakeholder networks. And I really want to emphasize that because between the Healthy Schools Network and CHIPS and Paula and our panel, we have very diverse networks here. Uh, she's also recognized as a leader and leading expert in biosecurity and is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and chair of the US Environmental Protection Agency's Homeland Security Research Subcommittee. Dr. Olsuski received her PhD in biological chemistry at MIT, and as an alumna, she was a member of the MIT Corporation and president of the MIT Alumni Association. She's also a member of MIT's Initiative for Faculty Race and Diversity Advisory Committee, and an advocate for diversity and ongoing supporter of MIT's Women in Chemistry. Thank you so much, Paula, for joining us, and please begin. Well, Claire, thank you for that kind introduction. And I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to um, talk about our report, uh, School Ventilation, uh, a Vital Tool to Reduce COVID-19 Spread. And um, I have the next slide, please. I'm a contributing scholar at the Center for Health Security. And we're kind of like a little think tank at Johns Hopkins, and we really work to protect people's health from epidemics and disasters, ensure that communities are resilient to major changes. And one of the, among the many things that the center likes to do is they really like to advance policies and practices addressing a range of challenges. And in this particular case, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is certainly a challenge and um, getting people to understand the role of indoor air in that it has been a challenge. All right, so the next slide, please. So today I'm going to um, give you a little background on uh, the work we were doing, explain the research process that went into um, developing the report, uh, then actually give, review the recommendations and conclusions from the report. And um, all right, so next slide. COVID transmission is airborne. I was one of the over 230 scientists who signed a letter to WHO oh, probably over a year ago, trying to convince them and CDC. But what's good now, in June of 2021, our leading health authorities now agree that transmission is airborne. So that's good. People. People spend 90% of their time indoors. And Rich Corsi, an, a noted indoor air quality expert, likes to say people spend more time indoors than whales spend underwater. I always find that fascinating. Improving indoor air quality can reduce the spread of COVID. 
an airborne infection, if you can do anything to improve your air quality, you can reduce that. And then our first product at the center was a graphic on how to make homes safer during COVID-19 by increasing ventilation and filtration. And while we were working on that, we realized focusing on school, indoor air quality in schools, both during and after the pandemic, was a really important research direction. And so we embraced that. So the next slide. So here I, I'm um, showing the graphic that we released just before uh, Thanksgiving of last year. Make the air in your home safer during COVID by increasing ventilation and filtration. All right. And uh, there is, um, you can download this from the website. You can, um, there are links about how to make a do-it-yourself filter, uh, the New York Times article on how masks work, and a one of the really important articles on how airborne transmission of COVID can be minimized. So this was our first big product. All right, so then, um, the next slide. So while working on this, I realized that many people did not understand ventilation. For many people, and this isn't wrong, they said, okay, they open a window, air generally comes in, that increases ventilation. All right, that, that's true. But what we're really focused on here, and I've used the definition from ASHRAE, the esteemed engineering uh, association that establishes all sorts of guidance and standards. And so ventilation is the process of supplying air, so either adding air or removing air from a space for the purpose, and I've highlighted here, controlling air contaminant levels, because that's really what we're focused on with an airborne virus, but also hum humidity or temperature within a space. And ventilation improvements are a cost-effective public health measure. And then I put in a plea, flexible funds available to schools to reduce risk are available. And so I really hope that, um, you know, that schools will embrace this. The next slide. Uh, so, one is, so when we embarked on our process, um, we started with a literature review, which meant a lot of that was in my brain, but we learned about more things. We interviewed 32 experts, and these are the experts agreed to be listed in the report. We talked to lots of other people who just said, well, you know, I really don't want to be listed in the report. But anyway, it was a broad range of stakeholders. We talked to teachers. We talked to aerosol scientists. We talked to indoor air quality specialists. We talked to social scientists and really tried to understand um, what the challenges were and what the opportunities were by talking to these experts as well as reviewing the literature. And so we were, we were drafting the report, but we realized that um, it, that sort of understanding the that the um, COVID was airborne, was contentious, and so on. And we decided it was best to have a conversation on what would eventually turn into our report. So we held a webinar in February, and it was literally was called A National Conversation on Indoor Air in K-12 Schools During the Pandemic. And we had over 450 participants we had people from all different branches of the government. We had a lot of people from CDC. We had uh, people from EPA, DHS, so on. We had lots of other stakeholders. And one of the things that was, and we had, a, we had an excellent set of panelists. One of our panelists, actually, uh, Joel Solomon, he'll be on the panel later today. But again, it was a range of panelists. It's just what, it wasn't just the engineers telling us what to do and so on. But it was important. Uh, to get to understand questions from stakeholders. So stakeholders had all sorts of questions and I didn't get to pick questions. I, I'm one of those nerdy scientists that just just loves the science, but it takes a lot more than science to get to, pra to really to get to policy and to practice. And we tried to answer as many questions as we possibly could. And so then on the next, next page, 
the next slide, please. We developed our report. And again, it's available online. Um, I tweet about it extensively. Um, I, maybe I should list my Twitter handle. It's my first initial blended into my last name. But here is the cover to the report. And in the back corner, you see a non-district HEPA air cleaner. You see a teacher. You see some students. People are wearing masks. And everyone's in the classroom. And our report was finally released at the end of May. And we had, uh, in the next slide, please, we make six recommendations. Five of the recommendations are aimed at school administrators and decision makers. And then the last one is aimed at the federal government. And I want to go through these uh, just so you understand what our message is, OK? The first message, the recommendation, is improve school ventilation now by bringing in as much outdoor air as the HVAC system will allow and upgrade your filtration. A well-running HVAC system can provide lots of good ventilation. Now, I do want to point out, and I probably should have pointed this out area earlier, that schools, homes, and offices, the uh, ventilation uh, requirements are designed around thermal comfort um, and odor control, unlike in hospitals where they're designed around health. So in hospitals, most of the places have at least six air changes per hour, and many have as many as 12 air changes per hour. So when you think about a place that has 12 air changes per hour, what that means is every five minutes, there's a, there's a whole room volume of, of new air comes in, whether it's fresh or conditioned or filtered. And so very quickly, whatever is in that air is just flushed out or filtered out. So step one, improve your HVAC. Now step two is purchase HEPA air filtration units and put them in, in classrooms and occupied spaces. Now, to improve your, to do recommendation one, you need, you need some help, you need some experts, you need to know what is your HVAC system. And I realize that are, there are many schools that have natural ventilation, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later. But the good thing about uh, portable or standalone HEPA air filtration units is it's not rocket science. It, you don't need an advanced degree. You need to sort of know this, the volume of your room and you read what the manufacturer says about, you know, what this. And you can, you can get some very good um, air exchange rates in, your, in wherever you place these. And the California Air Resources Board has tested, uh, it seems, looks like thousands of, portable air filtration units to show that they work. So there, there are lots and lots of these. these this is, there are lots of these available. And there's also guidance from the EPA and ASHRAE on how to select a, one of these units. So it, it's, this, this is approachable. All right, so the next, pay, next two recommendations are, um, first is, use only proven technologies for improving IAQ. So that is ventilation. It says here HEPA filtration, but go to all filter, you know, sort of as long as you're at filter filtration or ultraviolet germicidal irra irradiation. Sunlight, UV light in sunlight kills germs. Ultraviolet germicidal irradiation kills COVID. These are proven technologies. They've been in the peer-reviewed literature. There are all, lots of work on that. My, the next line is, do not use foggers or any air cleaner other than filtration and ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. The reason is they haven't been tested on schools. They haven't been tested on children. They have not been, not like, some of these things have not been um, survived the peer review literature yet or even gone out there. And just last week, the EPA held a very good webinar featuring two experts, Brent Stevens and Elliot Gall, 
on the ins and outs of selecting air cleaning devices. And I hope the slides and the webinar will be, but I, I highly recommend that to anyone who has considered some of these alternatives just to take a hard look before making those choices. Now the next recommendation is stop enhanced cleaning, disinfecting, deep cleaning days, and any other expensive and disruptive cleaning. Yes, follow CDC's current recommendations if there is a case then, or high touch areas and so on. But the, um, in some cases, schools were closed for deep cleaning. Uh, teachers were asked to clean and uh, their time should be spent really teaching or preparing to teach, not uh, doing cleaning. Some of these disinfectants can, that were designed for hospitals where again, you have high air change rates and the, you know, the fumes get flushed away quickly. Uh, you don't want those in a school. All right, so we have two more recommendations. The fifth one, next slide please, is if the school doesn't already have one, put in the mechanical system. Just this is, it costs money, but it's time to do it. And the benefits will happen, you know, will we'll survive COVID, will be for help students um, and teachers and help anyone that's in the school. So basically do that. And then our sixth recommendation is we need a task force dedicated to school air quality, because we need guidance for long-term. We don't want people to just like, oh, put a few portable air cleaners and now the pandemic's over and forget about it. It has to be long-term, it has to be sustainable, it has to be cost-effective. All of these improvements to indoor air quality in schools. And we need some sort of accountability measures to assess improvements. Air is invisible, it's hard to, you know, when you go in and take a deep breath, unless you smell an odor, you really, it's hard for most people to tell whether they're breathing in, uh, you know, good healthy air or polluted air. So then my, the next slide, and I'll just go through the, our conclusions. So airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic, can be reduced by improving ventilation. And it's so good now that WHO and CDC agree. There are federal funds available to enable schools to make changes. These changes will make our schools healthier during the current pandemic. If improved ventilation is properly installed, operated and maintained, students and educators will benefit for years to come. Next slide. The evidence-based recommendations in this report can help schools and school districts address COVID-related and long-standing ventilation problems. And this report can provide a foundation for infrastructure investments that reliably use proven technology to raise the air quality in schools, which will improve student learning and the health of everyone in school buildings for decades to come. Next slide. And he, uh, when Claire introduced me, she talked about network and so on. And so this is just the, the authors or the team of people um, who actually wrote the report, uh, including my collaborators, Richard Bruns, an economist, Gigi Gronval, an immunologist, Bill Bonfleth, a professor of environmental architectural engineering, and then uh, two public health, uh, analysts and a student. And so that that's a pretty diverse group to write a report. And then listed in the report are all our experts, but I, again, I, I thank all of the authors. I thank all of our expert reviewers listed here. And uh, Joel was one of them, Claire was one of them. We really appreciated the feedback. And then there were a whole series of other people at the center that helped with the project. And the, the project has been funded by the Open Philanthropy Project. Next slide. And that here's just the, if you, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to um, give more detail, but I thought it was just given the great panelists that are coming up, it would be good, really a good time. So I'll answer any questions if there are, are any right now. Otherwise, I'm happy to just continue uh, with the program. Th and thank you for participating and listening.
Um, Aaron, I think this is over to you now to introduce the panel. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Claire. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Jobson. I'm a principal at Quachokee Clock Architects in California, and we design public schools here in Northern California and a member of the board of directors of the Collaborative for High Performance Schools uh, with Elizabeth. Um, so we have four panelists in addition uh, to our wonderful speaker. So Sherry Lewis is Director of Business Services and Operations for Park Rose School District in Portland, Oregon. Sherry has been with the district since July of 2015 and prior to employment with, uh, with that district, she worked in Portland Public Schools for 10 plus years as Director of Accounting and Payroll. She's a graduate of the University of Memphis and her hobbies are spending time with her family and playing sports. And during her downtime, she spends time reading federal regulations for fun. Um, uh, Sherry, if you could uh, unmute yourself and say hi so everyone can see you, that would be great. Good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. I'm Sheree, and I'm from Park Rose School District in Portland, Oregon, uh, which is by the airport if you ever fly into Portland. Thank you, Sheree. I forgot to ask you if it was Sherry. I'm sorry. Uh, and our, our second panelist, Joel Solomon, has served for 16 years as senior policy analyst in the National Education Association's Collective Bargaining and Member Advocacy Department. He now leads the association's cross-department safety and health COVID-19 response team, covering topics including indoor air quality in schools. Joel, if you could say hi. Hey, folks. Thank you so much for asking me to be here. It's a pleasure and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Our third panelist is Ken Wirtz. Ken is Executive Director of the Massachusetts Facility Administrators Association and former Director of Maintenance and Operations for the Sharon Public Schools in Sharon, Massachusetts. He serves on the Massachusetts School Building Authority's Designer Selection Panel and on the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Reopening Site Support Team. Ken, if you could say hi. Uh, hey everyone, thank you for having us today. We're out here uh, just a little bit south of Boston on this beautiful sunny New England day uh, and appreciate the time to talk about how we can improve things. Thanks Ken. Uh, and then last but not least is Kelly Troutner is Senior Director for Health Issues with the uh, AFT. My bio here, AFT is not spelled out, but I think that's, well, I'm not going to guess. Oh, there it is. It's on the slide, American Federation Church. Uh, in her role, she serves as senior advisor to AFT President Randy Weingarten on all issues involving health and healthcare. She has served AFT as the lead staff person in the union's COVID-19 response and directs the union's health and safety program, staffed by technical experts who support AFT state and local affiliates nationwide. As the largest union in the AFL-CIO, the AFT has been an active participant and powerful influence in the labor movement's work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Kelly, if you could say hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. So getting us uh, going in the discussion. Um, Aaron, I thought, Aaron, sorry to interrupt. Excuse me. Someone's saying they're having a hard time hearing you. Can you orient yourself closer to your microphone? Um, OK, I'll, I mean, I'm using my headphone, so I can't really oh, get okay. any closer than that. But, OK. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, all right, so my first question was just, uh, you know, one of the things that we heard was um, how important ventilation is and sort of prioritizing that over the deep cleaning. And uh, I just kind of wanted to hear from, from all of our panelists on, you know, how is that, what are the biggest challenges been in getting stakeholders on board with that and investing uh, in ventilation? And if that's been a challenge that you've overcome and, and kind of how you've done that. Um, this is Shreya. I'll kind of speak for a school district. Um, as I'm a me medium-sized school district in the state of Oregon, um, one of the things that we initially have to do, because our constituents being the parents and the teachers, the first thing we had to focus on is doing that deep cleaning. And once that's been done, pretty much we're focusing on other things, and that one of the things is ventilation. Um, so it was a priority, and yes, I, I agree with what Paula's comments are, but when, uh, let's say, like, you have a case and you, you have a COVID case in the schools, uh, the, the protocol is to go back in and deep clean and sterilize it and get it clean and then deal with the, you know, ventilation is something that is, 
is a big topic, but is very costly. But we still have to clean. We don't deep clean every day. We do the standard cleaning and sterilize things that like we need to. But um, and we've spent additional funds to ensure that the staff have what they need to clean in a different way than what we've done in the past. But um, this district is putting some priority to ventilation and air quality, but it is a long-term project uh, that has to be uh, as we're prioritizing in our capital plans. Um, do you want me to, I can jump in now. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ken. All right, cool. Um, so some of our members, so, so we have about 180 members across the Commonwealth of Mass. Plus I do a lot of networking with other organizations similar to Oz, New Jersey, Michigan, Texas. Uh, we kind of go all over the map. And it seems to be the common story or the concern transitioning away from the deep cleaning uh, is our customer idea of what's an acceptable environment now. Um, and it's trying to educate parents, trying to educate teachers, trying to educate everyone that, no, we've moved on from our early thoughts of everything needs to be clean and sterile, and now we're focusing in on that. Well, the general public may not be on the same page as we are, so the optics of us backing off from going in with electrostatic sprays and things of that nature and not communicating it with everyone first has been some of the pitfalls that we've run into. And people have been focusing in on HVAC, much like Sherry was saying. Um, my concern from what I'm seeing is everyone focused on all that HVAC repair a year ago because HVAC contractors and technicians are hard to come by. So early on, we got everyone in the buildings, we got cranking. I don't know if people have gone back based off of like ASHRAE's guidance of check your units once a month. Um, nor do I think public schools across the country are staffed appropriately to have people able to go and do that. So where does that fall in? I, I don't know. Um, the other thing that we were chasing was trying to get everyone to shift over to green disinfectants uh, and no rinse sanitizers and no rinse disinfectants and, and citric acid based components because the, for the first time in, in, in at least our generation, we douse so much disinfectant in all of our buildings. We're losing finishes, uh, floors are, are delaminating, people are overexposed, so God knows what's gonna happen neurologically 10 years from now after we've, after we've uh, sanitized ourselves. So those are some of the things that I've seen, at least in our market from a facility standpoint. Yeah, I think it's definitely a communication challenge. I think we probably all have the you know, friend or family member that's still sanitizing their groceries and they come home from the store and it's kind of getting people around that that's what we thought then, but science progresses and we learn more and now these are the right uh, pieces to that. Um, Joel and, and Kelly, I, I wonder kind of how this is playing out in terms of your membership with the teachers and how, um, how you've seen maybe that engagement in the discussions around ventilation change over, you know, over throughout this, you know, past 14, 15 months. I think one thing is, um, you know, trying to a challenge with trying to get um, folks on board with prioritizing ventilation over cleaning is the fact that cleaning and disinfection is a concept that's been heavily socialized. We spray Lysol when someone has a bug or we wipe down surfaces that we know um, ventilation is a much more foreign concept to most people. Uh, so that's one piece of it. And I, I think another piece is that uh, just the sheer breadth of the issue. And one of the panelists mentioned cost, but, you know, a GAO report um, in, I think it was in 2020, estimated that uh, like over 40% of public school districts need to update or replace HVAC systems. So that's a, a massive problem that um, as a system across the board, it's hard to, to wrap our minds around how to do that, where to start. Um, and you know, to be frank, the CDC guidance hasn't been completely clear on this through its various iterations through the, the pandemic. So, you know, I think that, you know, that that and then, you know, understanding that ventilation is important and often that often uh, that will translate into occupancy, you know, that that's another another challenge because then we get into the physical distancing and then all the other, you know, layered mitigation strategies. It's complicated. <laughs> Yes, it is. And I, I think Kelly is exactly right on this. It, it's complicated. Cleaning disinfection is measurable. 
it, you people can see it, they think they're doing something. And we came out early on, as I know others did, and said, whoa, hold on here. They're cleaning disinfection. But we had to fight very hard in places to counter that. We had to do memos on the toxic chemicals and how they were being misused to try and stop it. It's very hard. On the ventilation side, it is complex. We find that people generally, their, not only do their eyes glaze over when you mention, let's talk about HVAC system, but they, they're disempowered because they think, you know what? We, we cannot do anything about it. We don't have the money. In, in some states where the state put money out to help schools improve ventilation, we couldn't find experts. Or there were experts who said, you know what? This is not airborne. What are you talking about? So the technical side is tough. And one of the reasons I want to thank Paula and the center for doing that report the way they did is because it demystifies the issues and provides not just a technical sense of what to do with HVAC systems, but practical things that can be done without changing an entire system. And one of our approaches at the National Education Association was to try and empower people to say, you know what, here are things we can do. And here are authoritative sources that say, here's what we can do with filters, here's what we can do with opening vents. And it doesn't mean it's not complicated. And another thing in the report I want to just highlight is, you know, it, it talks about opening windows. People talk about opening windows all the time, but there is a line in there that is so important that you have to worry about airflow. So putting all those things together, really important, really demystifying and providing another really important source to these arguments, it's hard. It's complex, but breaking down what we know has been the impediments to improving ventilation is doable and, and we are getting there. I have a question for uh, Cherie. Um, uh, in your schools, uh, over the course of the winter when everyone was telling us to open our windows and it was minus five, how was your thermal comfort in your classrooms? Just curious. Well, it was unique in Oregon because we didn't start coming back to school until about nine weeks ago so during oh, okay. the winter hours so we're in um that part of the country you guys have been doing two days on two days off yeah like pretty much the whole academic year in the state of oregon most of our school districts in the state of oregon have not been in the schools until the last couple months right so okay. we haven't dealt with that but we've had to deal with even when they do come back because it's cold in oregon we all know that it rains a lot right yeah. So whether or not you want to open the windows, and those are concerns because some people will say, if I'm using and putting in a new HEPA and I've now moved to MERV 13 and I'm doing all the things that the CDC has asked for, then why are you opening up the windows? Because you're just counteracting what you're doing. So right. those are the things that we're trying to look at. Yeah. So some I, of the questions that people have. I think it's a psychological piece that uh, the general public was trained that you need to open your windows at all costs. But from an operational standpoint, we have some pretty high performing buildings that are designed without operable windows because the air that's coming in through the air hammers is cleaner than what's outside. Um, reason I was just bringing it up because someone had typed in the chat that, you know, Pacific North, Northwest, it's getting hot. Um, so they're, you know, 100 degree days and people are stifling and uh, it's tricky to try and balance it all out because they don't have air conditioning, nor do we in the, in, in the Northeast. Typically, we haven't had to. What with climate shift and climate change and everything, we're having more of those those weird shoulder months where it's 92, 93 degrees in the middle of May. Um, I did have one question for Paula, if possible, and Joel as well. Um, the report was amazing. One thing I saw where most reports fall a little bit short is we talk about improving, rebuilding, fixing, replacing, all that kind of fun stuff. The, the place where we are now is better than we were pre-COVID. And from a facilities and operations standpoint, our industry has been telling everyone for years, 
that we're grossly underfunded, we're reactive, we're not proactive, we don't do preventive maintenance, we do reactive maintenance. When the heat's off, when a motor burns, when something breaks, we go fix it. Um, that being said, right now we're flush with, with funding from the federal government, thank God, um, but that funding's gonna go away. And we're already seeing districts right here in the Commonwealth of Mass already looking at cutting their maintenance budget for this operating cycle because they're having some funding issues. So we haven't even gotten past COVID, but everyone's feeling so comfortable and safe that we're already starting to sweep the legs out from underneath our, our maintenance and operations. Did you guys look at that from an annual sustainable, you know, funding process when you were uh, considering your report? We know that ongoing maintenance is a very important part for having good indoor air quality. You need to make sure your system is operating as intended. Air is invisible. And why it's morally acceptable in that GAO report for 40% of the schools to have bad HVACs and the, what, who says that it's morally acceptable for those kids to be and the teachers and all the other educators to be breathing unhealthy air? I mean, so, all right, so I, you can tell I'm very passionate. This yeah. project has be, made me even more passionate about indoor air because Nobody expects us to drink contaminated water, although I realize some schools have water problems, <laughs> and we have all these standards about our food shouldn't be contaminated. Why can't, why, especially our school children, why is it acceptable for them to breathe contaminated air? It's not. And but the problem is it's invisible. The problem is that people think it's too hard. But that, that's also why in the report, we include the Corsi box fan. I don't know if we called it that, but basically, and, and after the report came out, some people wrote from very poor school districts reached out to us and it showed how they did crowdsourcing so they could buy those. But they, those actually perform well. And Jim Rosenthal, who's the co-inventor with Rich Corsi, he has lots of good information on his company. He's a, he's a guy who sells filters in Texas, all right? But he, very thoughtful in terms of those can be very effective. So even in the poorest places, hopefully there's a way to, to improve the air quality. And can I also agree with you that a lot of the, uh, the places a year ago said, oh, well, we better, you know, even though their CDC isn't like really too clear about it, others seem to say we should do stuff. And I agree, there are lots of places that took good steps and it is important that they continue. And now I'll let Joel talk. Yeah, no, I think that's right. It's, it's not just a health issue, which it very much is. It's an education issue because we know that better indoor air quality leads to better educational outcomes. So it, it is both of those things. And we have been saying that for quite a while. I know the sponsors of the organizers of this event have been saying mm -hmm. that and doing a great job of pushing that. And it is crucial, I want to make it a little more complex even, because one of the things we know is that indoor air quality is an equity issue, where communities, primarily communities of color, have had fewer resources, worse indoor air quality, and now when funds are available, under-resourced school districts also have a harder time getting resources and using resources because of the staffing problem. So we have to also factor that in and make sure that everything we are all doing identifies and overcomes that problem. Uh, but it is, it is doable. We've been talking about preventive maintenance as a part of our regular ongoing conversations. The challenge, one of the many challenges is I mean, we, have four, we have 3 million members and we have 14,000 local associations and empowering each of them to have those conversations. Many, of course, of the school districts are right there with us, but where we have to have this as a 
uh, it, more uh, confrontational, it, it becomes hard, it becomes complex. But we also have a lot of examples where it's working really well with school districts because they get it, we're working together, we're doing joint work. Uh, so I, I'm actually hopeful. Yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful. I, I've seen some really amazing partnerships between the teachers and between the, the administration and different school departments and parents really stepping up and rising to the occasion, which is awesome because they're putting kids first. But then, like you mentioned, there are other communities where it's, it's very divisive, you know, and, 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 and we're butting heads. And I, I've been in those budget meetings. I've been in those presentations where there's an HVAC tech on the chopping block and people are like, well, why do you need it? We need to cut that. Everyone has to cut something. And I'm like, well, do you want fresh air? And do you want stable heat? Or, or, or do you want a teacher's aid in the classroom? Quite honestly, I want both. Because I think both are absolutely critical to the core mission, which is educating kids in a healthy and safe environment, both for the faculty and for the students. So but we only have a limited amount of funds, Sherry, right? And we, and we have to pick and choose. And depending on the community, that's where it comes into the conversation, what's a priority for them. And some communities do not care, or they just don't, they don't have the capacity to care because they don't have the funding to pull it off. So I think this so, brings, like you guys are bringing up uh, like five different questions that I've thought of as we go through <laughs> this too, but which is great. But one of them was, um, we talked about um, how visible and, and sort of apparent cleaning can be and how invisible ventilation can be. And I think that one of the things that the chips we've been advocating for in a white paper that we put out a year ago about ventilation and COVID too is, is can carbon dioxide monitoring, essentially air quality monitoring, um, and that that is a much more available technology and can give you, you know, a physical readout of what the air quality is in that space, both in terms of CO2, which is functionally kind of, you know, uh, measuring how much people are breathing out into the space, which is very much related to transmission and ventilation, but also other contaminants as well. And I think that's um, something that, that we definitely would advocate for and can help a little bit with that, making that more, more available so teachers and students and parents can see when the air quality isn't meeting those requirements. Sherry, I think you wanted to chime in. So um, I want to go back into Joel's comments and Kenneth yeah, sure, follow ahead. up. The thing that ASBO is doing with the AASA, which is the Superintendent's Association, is working with legislation and getting an infrastructure bill put in place. Now, every state monitors and managers bond money and school administration differently. So this makes it very difficult. So in this infrastructure bill, some of the guidance that we're trying to put into place that I agree with Joel and, and Kent that over time, it is people, it's teachers in the classroom and not the maintenance of the building. But it's also the school board and my job working with my staff to educate the public and my partnerships around me of what it's important to maintain, just like your house. If the heater goes out, don't wait until it absolutely dies. Do a yearly maintenance on it and do the roof. I mean, um, just like a car, you, ha you have to put gas in it. You have to put oil in it. It's maintenance. And it's similar to how I teach the book the board yearly of what a maintenance is and this and i work very closely with the teachers union and i i appreciate what you do kelly so much because the teachers are a big part of what the public sees so i'm teaching the teachers what it means to operate a building because teachers are their job is to to educate the students but if they don't understand the other side of this it's very difficult for you to get that feel so it's important for my job, and it's what I'm passionate about, is teaching superintendents and administrators what it means to run a school district. It's just not the teachers in a classroom, right? 70% of it isn't the teachers. It's all the pieces that make it run together. Um, in this infrastructure bill, we're hoping to focus on school districts around the country because I'm a small district. It took six votes, I passed a bond. The next time, I'm an 80% poverty school district. I have over 60 to 70% of kids of diversity. It's one of the highest in the state, one of the five highest in the state. So I have no extra money. 
please give me money or go ask for donations. So you have to look at constructive ways to go. And that's what part of this infrastructure bill is doing. Other part of it is reevaluating QZABs and reevaluating advanced refunding so districts can take advantage of financing options. So doing can do some of the things that Ken's talking about because yes, we're getting rid of people because it's not teachers. So what's the low hanging fruit? They get rid of maintenance workers, okay? Because they think it's easy and somebody else would do it. When you have a work order, hey, go do it. I unclog toilets, I drive a bus, I do whatever it takes in my district, but you won't find that everywhere. So when that, when you now have 200 work orders because you got rid of a maintenance worker, but that means education. And that education is taking the time and the passion to get out boots on the ground and learning your organization. And a lot of times that doesn't happen because superintendents sometimes come into their jobs and they've been administrators in a school. They've not done this other side. So it's a mystery to them. And that mystery is one of the biggest challenges superintendents have and the partnerships in the community is understanding. And COVID has bringing it snap right in their face because it is dealing with things that teachers are saying, I don't want to go back in the classroom unless I absolutely have that six, six foot radius everywhere. Then CDC changed it to three feet. Well, our teachers union said, no, I'm teaching it, keeping it to six feet, even though we said we could change it. So working with teachers in the community and the parents and say, I'm safe. And Paula, I know you say, don't do that deep cleaning, but parents say, if you don't clean, I'm not bringing it back in. So it's, it's a happy medium right there. So I have to be, you have to be fluid in that education and working with Ken's organization being a facilities person. And I'm the facilities director until I just hired somebody. So up on the roof and running that HVAC and determining, do I need a MER 13? Well, actually, if I run a MER 13, that might burn out my motor quicker because it requires this. Okay, do I have the money when I have to replace motors quicker than I needed to be. So it's educating the community and making it, because Paula, you said it right on. This is not an easy subject. Yeah. And sometimes you need a PhD to understand how HVAC works, right? So uh, just to, if you have lots, I have 46 different languages trying to translate that to a parent saying, yes, I'm taking your safety. It is utmost important. And they're looking at you going, uh, what? So how to translate that very difficult language into something that I need for my parents to understand. And I'm hoping with the infrastructure bill and some of the things we're doing, Joel, I can focus on what you just said. Ken, your concerns that you're losing staff. Okay, Kelly, I can focus on all the things that teachers have concern about because they're gonna say, Shree, I need a HEPA. I need help. I want one in my room. I want one in my room. I can't afford it for every classroom. One of the comments said, hey, I got 1,500 classrooms. Do you think I can afford $700 for 1,500 classrooms? I can't. And the cost of filters. So having the HVAC. I know in a district right next to me, they just got rid of the HVAC technician. And I'm like, are you crazy? Why? <laughs> if you're going to do, that would not be one I got rid of. Because you cannot hire them. It's like electricians. They're God. I'd pay them more than I get paid. Please. Because it keeps you safe. Yeah. Right? I think one so of if the I talk about preventing ventilation versus cleaning and the prioritization. So I'm very passionate, Paula, just like you are. Just on a different end. I don't have a PhD. You know, this is good, Sherry. I can never yeah. know too many people. And again, I'm happy to, you know, give this talk or some version of it to all sorts of groups because people need to understand there are steps we can take. Some of them is going to cost the big bucks. Others, again, you know, pulling together money for a box fan and a few, fil uh, you know, furnace filters. Also understanding that, you know, maybe if you go to MERV 11, you still get some good protection, okay? MERV 13 is ideal, but again, so there, there's a lot of, um, it, it, there's nuance and you're right. And may, I do have a PhD, but you know what? My goal is to make sure all sorts of people who didn't even graduate, you know, 
with limited education can understand why it's important that we need to have healthy indoor air and what are some simple steps that we can take now and we need to take in the future. And the point about the, CO, the carbon dioxide monitors, it's a way of making your air visible. We didn't, uh, that is in our infographic that we, um, for homes that we posted before, we didn't put it in the school's report just because we thought that we, the classrooms would be better off spending the money on one more um, air filtration device than a CO2 meter. But that was, you know, a choice that we made. I think one of the, Thanks. you know, one of the issues that we're all aware of, but uh, there's obviously a lot of passion from this whole group around is, how important school, the quality of school facilities is to education and to educational outcomes. And I think one thing that I'm mildly hopeful about from this is that these air quality issues, the, the, just, you know, the reality of COVID will highlight that. that uh, and then I think that's a really important thing around air quality too, is that it's not just that it you know, prevents COVID transmission, it also prevents other disease transmission, which lowers absenteeism. It also improves cognition by reducing the, the carbon dioxide levels and other pollutants and things. And there's, there's a lot of big impacts that have to do with, you know, essentially better schools is better learning and better buildings is better learning. And that's something that we've been focused on a lot, obviously forever with, with chips. And there's a lot of as aspects to indoor air quality that I've seen brought up in the chat too, whether they have to be with volatile organic compounds or the cleaning products that were mentioned, like those are, you know, those are detriments to indoor air quality that have, uh, when they're used too much, and then it's too high of a concentration. Um, Paula, one question that came up in the chat uh, as well is if you could talk a little bit about the rebreathe factor and, and define that and, and kind of help explain that from your research. All right. So one of the important things to remember is what is the source of the COVID virus in the classroom? Well, the source is a person who's infected with the virus. And they may, they may start to feel sick or they may have no symptoms. Mm -hmm. But every time they breathe out, they release um, aerosol particles and droplets that contain virus. And if they talk, it's projected. If they're singing or shouting, it's even more and more, you know, so, just the process of communicating spews your breath. And if you're infected, your breath is in fact, you know, you're spewing coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So if you're right next to someone who's infected, you're, it's really easy for you to breathe in what they have. All right. And if you're a little further away, it's harder. If people are wearing masks, that cuts down. Basically, we're breathing in each other's air, you know, people exhale. And so that goes to the air changes per hour. If you can get to, uh, you know, four to six air changes per hour, you know, it's six. That means every 10 minutes the air is refreshed. So then you, you, the, ch the opportunity to rebreathe someone else's infected air goes way down. So we're diluting out. Uh, the particles, whether they contain COVID or not, they're diluted out there. And that's why I put in the, you know, ventilation about removing, removing contaminants. Mm -hmm. And that's what essentially what the CO2 monitors measure too, because you're also breathing out carbon dioxide. Exactly. And you breathe out carbon dioxide. And, and I've found with, I, I have uh, a number of carbon dioxide monitors. Uh, I've purchased them for many family members, and the, the uh, and I've seen observed children really enjoying breathing on them and seeing how high the numbers can get. Yes. <laughs> so it's just it, it's a real visual. But one of the concerns is that it's not you know it, it, just because your CO two levels could be low, you could still have someone in there who you know it, someone sure. who has the uh, disease and is. But again, off. I think I think they're, they're good. I've carried them around. I've been surprised where I've seen some high levels, but um, it, 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 it's a useful technology. Joel and, and, and Sheree, you both have your hands up. Joel, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. You know, I wanted to follow up on two things. You know, the CO2 discussion we were just having, it can be very important. It's easy to get 
CO2 monitors wrong, in the wrong yeah. location, to read them incorrectly, to look for them to be doing things, what to be telling really us things that mm -hmm. they sh they're not actually able to tell us. But also, while it, it, they also can't serve as an indicator that there is no COVID present. No. It, so we also have to be very careful about what we ascribe to them as, as their function. But uh, going back to Cherie, and I think you made some very good points about staff and making sure school employees are maintained who, you know, not getting rid of school employees for this reason. There's also, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge in school employees, the custodial and maintenance staff, uh, some who are HVAC experts, but some who just know a lot about the cleaning and disinfection and the appropriate way to do that and how to maintain systems, but also to identify when there are problems. And if we get rid of those people, you know, we may need to call in a technical expert, but if we don't have people in schools who are able to say, hey, you know what, there's a problem with this reading or the computer readout says it's fine, but I can tell that there is no airflow, whatever it is, that's a human component and very important. And another way that we have found it very effective actually to achieve multiple goals, labor management collaboration on this can be really important. Collective bargaining doesn't have to mean you're sitting fighting each other again, you know, across the table. Sometimes it's that, sometimes that's necessary, but collective bargaining, labor management, healthcare committees, and even where we don't have that, we have seen really effective school walkthroughs done by school employees, not technical experts. We give them some training, we give the, and they can walk through the building and say, they, we, we give them, here are some key things to look for, and we have had great success, and that does multiple things here. They can identify problems. Hey, you know what, there's no air coming out of this vent, even though it should be, or, oh my goodness, we put that, last year we put the bookcase right up against the vent, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff, and that can make a big difference, but that empowers people, it shows the, and it, and it gives all our school employees the ability to honestly say we are working on this we are involved we are finding problems that builds a sense of security i can tell you i mean we national education association has been talking to our members throughout uh, this pandemic about their concerns and after requiring students and staff who test positive for covid to isolate Improved ventilation is on the top of their list of concerns. That message has gotten through, but only a third say ventilation is being dealt with appropriately in school. So, you know, we need to overcome those problems, but empowering people, engaging people, labor management, collaboration on this stuff is really important. Joy. Go ahead, Sharika. I'm just gonna call on you. <laughs> So I agree with you. Some of the barriers um, that we that we have in a school district, and I, you know, I'm I'm in a relatively big city. Portland's somewhat big, right? It's the one of the things is you have to have the skilled technician or the contractors. And if you're a small school district like myself, medium size, uh, I know uh, Bonnie's on the call. She's from a large school district in the state. They have the ability to get that contractor more than I can, because I'm a small fish in that pond, right? Why would they come for $100,000 when they could go to three to $4 million contract? Because that's more appealing. They're gonna make the money off that. So that's been some of the challenges for smaller school districts. To get that vendor that you know is the best qualified, you, one of the other things is you have to go through the lengthy RFP process, because we are government, ESSER requires you to do all those things that are in the 
procurement guidelines and you want to do those things. I'm not saying you want to bypass them, right? But those take time, right? And that means an evaluation. I know I uh, just put out an RP doing something similar to ventilation. I had it out there, only two vendors. Now there's lots in this state that would do it. But like I said, I'm a small fish in that pond. So then you, is that a substandard vendor or is that a good vendor? Do you take it or you put it back out again, right? So those are some of the questions that you have to ask yourself. I mean, budgets are a big problem, right? And ventilation, I, I think is a big thing, but ventilation takes time. And you, ha like Joel and Ken said, you have to apply some degree of diversity in how you select those things. Because it's important because you have to know that you've, okay, why would that school get it versus another? Okay, maybe because they have more, they have more, oh, they don't have any air conditioning, but that other school has some, I mean, one little wing that's air conditioning. So you have to look at that. One of the things that we in school districts challenge, uh, are constantly challenged with, and I had 126 buildings in PPS, which is Portland Public. Okay, I have 15 here, right? They're all different ages. Huh, does contracting rules change over age? Hmm, yeah, they do. And not one of them have the same system. Okay, so then learning, so I'm sitting here with a spreadsheet when I knew I was teaching that uh, help on the panel is I pulled up all my HVAC and looked at each building and I said, wow, every building has a different structure. Wow, isn't that fun? Wouldn't yeah. you all like to do that? Okay. I, had to, it's easy I, had to I had to unmute so I could laugh with you. Oh my God. <laughs> right, and I'm sitting here going, wow, what's my type of unit radiant? Heat radiant, no gas pack. Yeah. Okay, all those changes yeah. mean that CO2 is different. How do I measure those levels? They're all going to be different depending on what kind of unit you have. And that's when I said educate and understanding, that's the thing I have to take to the board, this huge Google sheet, and make it in a way that is, as I would say, the third grade reading. Okay, yeah. do you understand it? Because Teachers are extremely intelligent, but if I gave them this, they would be like, uh-uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but it's important yeah. to the teachers because it's important to their classroom. So I have to take I it and educate them. I think one of the that we all understand and can see from the chat and from all this discussion is, you know, that solving the problem of, of ventilation is complicated and it's different for every school, it's different for every building and maybe even every classroom. And, uh, but I do want to get to a few audience Aaron, can I, just, can I just comment quickly on Joel's yeah, ahead, uh, Joel thing about labor management because it all ties in together and then and then I'll just make this brief. Um, I, I bet a lot of people that are on this call right now have heard, you know, the people say, oh, I hate my building. I hate my new building. We can't get it to run. It's terrible. Or you've also heard people say, my custodians aren't smart enough to run my building. Well, all of that links back to labor management. And to shame on you for calling out the custodian and saying they aren't smart enough, maybe you just haven't provided them the opportunities and the resources they need to learn that. So the recommendations that I see and the things that I, I've seen have been successful, you need to ask two questions first. Do you have someone internally who has the skill set to run and understand these complicated systems? Or do you have someone that has the capacity to learn? If, the, if either of those two things are great and you give them legitimate professional development, project closeout training of 20 hours to teach someone how to operate a building is baloney. It doesn't work. You need to send them to a legitimate school, whether it's night courses, whether it's something, send them away to a, an institute, get them the training they need. If you don't have those two things in line, then you need to consider outsourcing it and hiring a contractor who has the skill set and the capacity to manage your buildings properly because that's how you're really gonna assure all these air quality hopes and goals that we have are actually gonna to come to fruition. And you need to pay them more. Yes, Because indeed. they become Hallelujah. better educated. And that's where the union goes. We have teachers, they teach more subjects or teach more difficult subjects. They get additional pay. Sometimes in the classified unit, as we call it here, they don't get that. They just get more stuff added to their plate with no, no additional pay. When we add this requirement, 
they need to be respected enough to give them the additional pay. And I, here I'm the person who doves out the money and going, I don't want to do that because I don't have no money. But I'm saying, if you want it, you have to, just like buying clothes or anything else you have, you want quality, you need to pay for the quality. I have to say, Cherie, the National Education Association couldn't have made a stronger argument for uh, better pay. But go, you know. But seriously, that I mean, it, that is quite right. And and having folks on staff is also really important. Not doing that outsourcing because you have people with eyes on, with hands on, who are gaining knowledge of those particular systems. So keeping that in house and building that knowledge and expertise and compensating appropriately, all really important. I, I, Joel, I, I have to disagree with you on that. I think you need a little bit of both. We have some uh, communities that it's one school that's 35,000 square feet that serves 100 kids. You're not going to get a highly skilled person in that type of environment. They're just too rural to pull it off. So you provide some rudimentary training on how to operate the building. But in that case, in that scenario, I think it makes sense for them to look at getting a professional company to come in, you know, to log in remotely once a week to make sure the dampers are actuating, to make sure you bring in the fresh air, to check the CO2 levels, because it's not like everyone's been talking about. It's not a one size fits all. So I would just, I would just be cautious to tell people you should, uh, where there are some best practices that are the right fit for you as a rural community. I was on a panel presentation uh, a few years back with uh, the facility director from Dade County, Miami, who had 250 maintenance techs, and a facilities director from the Ozark Mountains who had seven students in his school. I can't tell those people the same approach works for them. So I would just be cautious about that. Uh, I wanted to take a couple of questions from the chat. Um, so, so one of them had to do with uh, UV germicidal radiation and uh, if there, there are many different types of that and if there were kind of specific recommendations on in air handling units in the ductwork or in the upper room, if, if there, but one knows of research that kind of points in one direction or another with those. Our report references a document that I think came out of the CDC or NIOSH on um, using upper room uh, germicidal irradiation. And I think this was, um, Shelley Miller's one of the authors, and this is actually against tuberculosis, which is really a, a terrible, you know, it's very hard to uh, crack. So, and um, I don't know if it's in there or another one of Shelley's papers, but if that is installed, you know, correctly, that is the equivalent of 17 air changes per hour. You can get up to that. And so, um, some people say that those would be good in homeless shelters or in bus stations or whatever. But again, so there, there there's good literature and it's not necessarily new, it, it, it's old, but um, in how, how that works. And um, I mean, I don't know, there are mm -hmm. some new developments to make things more energy efficient and so on. Uh, and but, I think from, from the research that I've done, I think there could be challenges with the ones in the air handling units and the ductwork because the air is moving too fast. Right. Well, that so point. that's and the thing in terms of is the, radiation. yeah, is the air in, in getting enough uh, exposure to the UV light before it's it all moves on? Be, I mean, with all these conditions, it needs to be looked at for, for each individual situation and figure out what is best. Uh, but these are the kinds of, of things that should be evaluated. Uh, Aaron, if I could jump in on that, we did a, a ton of research here in Massachusetts regarding UVCG lighting, and you're right, it depends on the application. So uh, installing UVC lamps, just for anyone that's on the call, before your coil on the intake side is typically where we used to install them. That was to protect the equipment. It had nothing to do about the occupants. We were trying to buy more time on our coil. So yeah. now we're looking at it as a, a curative form of fighting pandemics and fighting diseases and whatnot. If you're installing it on the return duct side, that's only for a system that you're expecting to mix that return air back into the supply air. Otherwise, there's no point doing it. Uh, and that's when you look at some of the newer technologies. If you're installing VRF, you know, uh, heating units in your classrooms and things, typically those systems are designed to bring in 100% fresh air makeup anyway. Mm -hmm. So in that case, 
you would need to go with the uplighting in your classroom. So you really need to talk to engineers and, and people who are up to date on the most current technology because it, it's a moving target and it changes weekly. You can also buy those cool little robots that drive around your building and put off UV CG light too. A lot of districts are looking at those. I think that pretty much brings us simply to the end of the time. I'm sorry we didn't have more for, um, you know, for audience questions. Um, there are a lot of very specific technical questions about, you know, this system or that technology for specific um, for specific conditions. And I think that underlines the point that it's a complex problem that you have to have boots on the ground, you know, as uh, as Joel was talking about, as as you talked about, Ken, about having the right mix of uh, staff and expert you know, consultants to be able to tackle these issues and find the technology and the approach that's right for that. And I think the other thing for, for all of us and for everyone is just making sure that we're advocating for this at every level for the funding that needs to go with it and raising the awareness about um, you know, the important investing in school facilities. And hopefully that makes it through to the infrastructure package that's been uh, being negotiated now. And I would encourage everyone to connect with Claire and connect with Elizabeth and, and, and our teams that are advocating for that and add your voices to that discussion too. So I think with that, we should, it's 11.15 to keep this on time. We should probably go ahead and close out. Thank you uh, to all of the panelists. Thank you to, uh, to everyone who put this together and facilitated today. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Really appreciate the discussion and all the expertise that was lent today. Thank you too, Aaron. It was really, this was terrific. And we just loved the turnout and the questions in the chat box. It was terrific. Uh, Elizabeth, this is back to you to close up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this was a pleasure to host for you. Um, think of it as an appetizer to a series that we're gonna be launching in the fall where we'll dig into some of these topics in more depth, including healthy and green cleaning, and some more on ventilation and the role of commissioning and how important that is. Uh, we will post all of the information on that series at chips.net. Thank you again for attending. <laughs>